So today's training is how to work with the St. Louis Community Foundation, engaging with the St. Louis Community Foundation, and it's presented to you by our community investment team. First, we have Elizabeth George. She's our Director of Community Investment. Elizabeth joined the St. Louis Community Foundation in 2018 and has over 20 years experience in the philanthropic sector. Her role is to connect community and donors, whether individuals, families, private foundations, or institutional funders. In community, Elizabeth identifies mission-aligned initiatives or issues and determines how the community foundation can best support those efforts. Next up is Nikki, Community Investment Manager. Nikki is a social worker and a nonprofit professional with over 15 years of experience. She brings an expertise of the nonprofit sector to her work as a grant maker. She works to stay educated about the local nonprofit landscape, support organizations in their efforts to connect to the community foundation, and assist donors to achieve their philanthropic visions. Last but not least, Emily Seipel is our community investment assistant. She joined the Community Foundation in 2021 and has over five years of nonprofit program management and local policy development experience. She enjoys learning from nonprofit leaders in St. Louis while providing research and day-to-day -day operations support for the Community Foundation's grant making and community initiatives. So there's going to be a question and answer session after the training. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat whenever you like, and I will pass it off to my wonderful colleagues. Thank you, Emily. If you could advance the thank you. There we are. We look so, so fancy. Um, in the chat, if everyone could um, share your name and your organization and, uh, and one or two questions, if you um, have more than one that you'd like to see answered today, our team will be monitoring the chat throughout. So we'll be answering questions um, both in the chat and outside the chat, and we'll make sure that everything, um, everything gets answered. And we're so excited to have everyone here today. So I'm gonna start off with an, a little bit of an overview about the St. Louis Community Foundation, um, who we are, where we've been, where we're going, and, um, and how, um, you know, how we fit into the St. Louis Public Foundation. So I think for all nonprofits, you have to start off with your mission because that's what brings us all to work um, every morning. Um, and the St. Louis Community Foundation's mission is to encourage purposeful philanthropy that connects community and donors to build and preserve a more equitable and vibrant region now and forever. I always have seen, um, the, the word that jumps out to me um, in our mission has always been connect. It really is our um, role and I see it as our role and my role to, to connect the community with um, the donors that we work with or the individual family and private foundations that we work with. And it's, it's really exciting work, especially for someone that is a social worker. So we'll dive into a little bit more of our history to get a background of where um, the foundation started and where, um, where we're planning to head in the future. We were founded in 1915. We were actually one of the first um, community foundations established in the United States. Uh, Cleveland beat us by just a little bit, but we were number two. And for many years following this founding, um, following the, the people in the community of St. Louis that came together, to, to fulfill philanthropic mission through the Community Foundation. We had a, at a time where we weren't growing too much. Um, we spent a lot of time kind of um, dormant, a little bit dormant. And then during the 1980s is when we really saw our kind of renaissance. And that came because of um, the, the proliferation and the, um, the popularity of donor advised funds. Um, these were, th these became very popular in the 80s for people of wealth to, to put their philanthropic dollars um, aside and essentially create a philanthropic checkbook. And in the, in the 1980s, the Community Foundation sort of, or the St. Louis community kind of came together and said, hey, we need a community foundation to make these sort of things happen. And lo and behold, we already had a community foundation. So we dust off, dusted off those trust documents and we really started to expand from there. But our major, major growth has really happened within the last 10 years. Um, we have seen our, um, our, the number of funds that we have grow exponentially since 2010. Um, oh, I think um, so we started off around 2010 with about $150 million in, in, um, in assets. And today we have about a little over $500 million in assets. We have over 800 funds. Um, we work with many, many donors, families, individuals, corporations, 
um, people of all sorts that want to invest in the St. Louis community and they want to use their philanthropic dollars to make impact. In 2022, um, out of those 800 funds, the St. Louis Community Foundation made over 7,000 7, grants, 7,200 grants, and invested over $110 million in the nonprofit community. And we're so proud of that because there are so many different avenues that that happens, and we're excited to talk to you about those today. Oh, it looks like my internet might be um, a little unstable, so I'm going to go off video. So let's talk a little bit more about how the Community Foundation works. Uh, what, what is it that we do? Next slide, please. Next. So we have a variety of funds that we offer here at the Community Foundation for our donors. Um, uh, those many, many of our uh, funds are those donor advised funds that I talked about. We also have what we call designated funds that are designated to a specific cause, organization, um, specific campaign, whatever those, whatever that might be. Again, that is the intention of the donor. Um, we also have some discretionary funds. This is not the biggest pool of funding that we have here at the St. Louis Community Foundation. Those are the funds, the discretionary funds, which would allow us to do a little bit more community building and um, invest in projects that, that we as the Community Foundation, not our donors, um, necessarily see as, as worthy investments. We have hopes to really um, grow those discretionary funds over the course of the next 10 years. Field of interest funds, these are, um, again, for specific causes or um, specific projects that, um, that our donors wish to invest in. We have scholarships, and then we also do work with some um, nonprofit organizations um, to hold their endowment funds. Um, as some of you may, may understand, investing and holding investment funds can be a really um, difficult process, and some organizations don't want to take on the management of that, and we, we can come in and, and assist in that way. Next slide, please. Nikki, am Who I... we support? Oh, go ahead. Do you want to keep going or? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I totally did what you did to me last year. <laughs> I, I kept going. No, I'm going to let you go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Best laid plans. And Nikki is such a wonderful presenter and speaker that it's hard to hard to stop her once she gets going. Um, so there's a question about clarifying the field of interest funds in the in the chat. And I will go back to that. So a field of interest fund is a fund that is around that's established around a particular field or a particular area of interest, and we use those in many different ways. So for instance, our COVID fund was a field of interest fund and the field of interest then was COVID response. The welcome fund for um, refugees and asylum seekers is a, is a field of interest fund. Those are funds that weren't created by donors, they were created by the community foundation as a whole. Um, the, the other, we do have donors that create field of interest funds. And that is if they say, you know, I want to, um, I want to give in the area of children, youth and families, or I want to give in the area of the environment. I want to give in the area of the arts. Then a field of interest fund um, gives them the ability to do some things that you can't necessarily do with a donor advised fund um, and yet still specify that area of interest that, that the donor um, is, wants to support um, philanthropically. And if when the donor, um, when it's a donor led field of interest funds, we don't have, you know, it's just like with any other donor advised fund, um, the donor really con controls where those those grant decisions are made. So I hope that helps clarify that a little bit. Okay, so who do we support? Um, we do support individual donors. Um, so those are, you know, from those individual donors, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, you know, how they can, the range of donors that, that we work with. And we support community. If you go back to that mission, it's connecting community and donors so that we can build a more equitable region, right? So we can be more purposeful in our philanthropy. 
our CEO always says that if you think about the community foundation as a um, as a triangle, the individual donors are the base of that triangle that that provide much of the fuel, but the apex is the community. That's what that's the where where we have our greatest impact. We also work with companies and corporations to support them with their um, philanthropy, and we um, provide back office support for a number of private foundations. So let's talk a little bit about those individual donors. When we think about individual donors, and when you think about working with um, the community foundations individual donors, you need to think about this sort of like stewarding any other major gift or major donor for your organization. Um, and as you know, some you know, donors range from those transactional donors to those really much more complex donors. So when we think about a transactional donor, that's a donor who, um, typically knows exactly what they wanna do. They're gonna come in, they're gonna do it, and then we're not gonna hear from them other than when they tell us where they want their grants to go. Oftentimes they set up identical annual distributions. So they'll say, you know, every year I'm gonna give X amount to these seven different nonprofits. Um, they also typically are giving to their places of worship, to schools or a pet project or pet um, organization that, that they have. We frequently have very little communication with those individual donors. They just come in, they make their grant recommendations, and then, um, and then we hear from them either the following year or the next time something comes up. We also work with a number of anonymous donors. And um, every year, we will hear from someone who says, hey, you know, I got um, I got a grant from the Community Foundation from um, this, you know, they might list the name of a fund, um, the Rio Vista Fund, and can you tell me who's behind that? And they, we will not, you know, if somebody, if one of our donors is giving anonymously, we will protect that anonymity. Um, oftentimes, those anonymous donors are far more active in their philanthropy, they are researching, they are, um, they're a little more knowledgeable about what, the, what it is that they want to do, and their grants will vary year to year. And they use the community foundation not to sort of park their philanthropic dollars, but so that they can give in a variety of ways and, um, and be able to do that on their terms rather than um, be, be sort of asked a lot about their giving. And then we have complex donors and our complex donors are very creative. They come up with ways to support community that we haven't even thought of sometimes. Um, and they typically are really passionate about something. So for instance, you'll hear a little, Emily's going to talk a little bit about um, one of our anonymous funds, the, the um, Gateway Regional Environment um, Fund and, or GREF. And those are a couple of donors who they know what they, they know what they're about. They know what they want to do. They've researched it. They're in touch with us a lot. And they're going to make those decisions. Oftentimes they create, create criteria for grant making. Sometimes they even do a competitive grant program or a targeted grant program where they will ask for a grant um, proposal. Sometimes they, um, they want that grant report. Always they will want some kind of communication from the, um, from the organizations that they're giving to so that they, um, so that they know what is happening with their dollars. Um, and um, oftentimes they will provide multi-year grants. They recognize that if this is something they're passionate about, they're going to do it year after year after year. Let's let the nonprofits know and let's make that part of how we give. Um, yeah, David Bobber just put in the chat, activists, investors. Yes, that is correct, David. Um, we also support corporate donors. 
So, um, and this can look a, a variety of different ways. So um, from those where we come in and we help with a particular project. So BJC, we have partnered with BJC for a couple of years on their BJC Gives Back program where they um, accept application or nominations from um, team members throughout the BJC system of nonprofits that um, would receive a small grant and then we work with them to help make those decisions. All the way through um, an organization that we um, sort of know and love, um, Chemline Corporate, Chemline, let's see if I can talk, Chemline Company. Um, last year they were giving anonymously, this year they are um, have gone public with, with their interests, but the company owner um, really wanted to imbue the philanthropic spirit throughout the company. So he put together a, a team, a Chemline Cares Committee, to go to really think through what areas they wanted to give in and what nonprofits they want to support. And we have been with them along that journey, helping them to learn a little more about the issues to learn a little more about who in the nonprofit sector is, is um, working in the areas that they're interested in and then helping them with the, with the grant um, review and grant decision-making. We have employee care funds. Um, the, the employee care funds are programs that help employees cope with an unexpected hardship, um, you know, some kind of a qualified disaster, which could be a natural disaster like hurricanes, or it could be a personal hardship, um, a fire in your home or um, a severe health um, um, setback. And so those employee care funds are when businesses are then providing some fund some funds for those um, individuals that that to support their team, to support their staff. And then um, we have employee-led giving programs, which um, are uh, when employees come together to make decisions about where they want to give. So um, that's a little bit about our corporate donors. Um, probably where we've interacted with a number of you is through the private foundations that we support. And um, the three ones that people know the most about are Pettus Foundation, uh, Burgess Family Foundation, and the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust. Um, the first two are family foundations, and the last one is a health conversion foundation. And each one of them works a little bit differently. So the Pettus Foundation, their focus areas are education, youth development, and workforce development. And um, the Pettus Foundation trustees um, include a family member, um, a close family friend, and then their corporate trustee. So in effect, we, um, Nikki, Emily, and I are the staff for the Pettus Foundation, and they work by invitation only. So um, as we get to know organizations that fit into those areas of education, youth development, workforce development, we will um, bring forward those that, um, well, we, we let them, let the trustees know about everybody that we met with, but then um, they select those that they want to um, ask to submit a, a grant application. Burgess Family Foundation, we have to say they're going through some transitions um, as the foundation has grown and as um, the family has shifted and changed. The Burgess Family Foundation has um, very recently hired a CEO, Kelly Pollock, who has just been delightful to work with. Um, therefore, Pillars are cultural engagement, STEM preparedness, youth empowerment, and support for our heroes, meaning our veterans and our first responders. And um, online, if you look at the, either their um, website or our website, you will find a link to their letter of intent that you can fill out online. And that is the way to start the process of um, conversation with, um, with the Burgess Family Foundation. Um, 
They also work by invitation. So once that LOI goes in, um, the, the combination of trustees, Kelly and our staff um, will make the determination of um, who they'll invite to, to, um, to submit a full application. And, and in reality, that those decisions rest with the trustees. And then lastly is the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust, um, the EPHT as we lovingly call it. Um, and this is a, um, a health conversion foundation that's really all about access to health care. And Emily in a little bit will talk about how EPHT is shifting its funding um, and, and its strategy. So I'm going to hold off on that and let Emily um, talk about EPHT in a little bit. Okay, so let's talk a minute about how the Community Foundation approaches community. I mean, we are a community foundation. Um, we are, um, we're place-based where the work particularly of our team is in the St. Louis region and, um, and the majority of our grants are for the, the St. Louis, whether it's, it's out of our, our office, the community investment office or from our donors directly, um, the majority of our grants are here, stay here in St. Louis. Over the last several years, really starting um, with the death of Michael Brown in 2014, we have been on a journey, um, on, our, on a racial equity journey, and equity is the priority. When we think about anything that we do with those limited discretionary dollars that Nikki talked about, um, as we consider um, the initiatives that we support, really um, put racial equity as the top priority. We also think about other forms of equity, so gender, disabilities, um, equity for those who are new to our country, um, but it's that racial equity that, that is core. We also focus on regional issues. We are about the St. Louis region, and so that's where you see things like COVID or the Census 2020 fund um, or the welcome fund, you know, these are regional issues that we feel um, we can help bring philanthropy to the table um, to address some of these, these issues. Over the last several years, as we think about trust-based philanthropy and how our organization, how our team can lean into trust-based philanthropy, we um, we think about how we can build relationships. Um, so more and more you will hear, um, hear from us that we'd like to chat, we'd like to meet. Rather than having lengthy reports, can we have a 20 minute or half hour phone call to hear about what happened with your donors? I mean, with your grants. Um, it's, we, we recognize that um, we get a whole lot more from that conversation than we do from the written piece of paper or the annual report that you send us electronically. The other thing is as we have, um, as, as we develop our own funding initiatives like our Black Communities Investment Initiative or the COVID Fund or the Welcome, any of them, we're really working to center community voice. We recognize that we, you know, we sit in one seat, um, those on our board sit in other seats, um, and you, the community, know best what the community needs are and what the community solutions are. So as we develop our um, funding initiatives, more and more you will hear about advisory committees, you'll hear about um, focus groups, you'll hear about ways that we can center community voice in our work because we believe that will make our work better and stronger, which will make our community better and stronger and more vibrant and more equitable now and forever. So, um, so here are some of those pooled and partnership funds um, that we talked about earlier and that we think about um, when we're bringing forward our community perspective. Um, 
So when we think about pooled and partnership funds, these are usually funds that, not usually, these are funds that more than one funder has contributed to. Um, so the Welcome Fund, we had 10 different um, foundations and um, public funding bodies like the Mental Health Board that contributed to the Welcome Fund. It was specifically about um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers coming into our community. Um, the COVID-19 Regional Response Fund, that was a community-based um, initiative. We started with a number of our foundation friends um, that, that said, yes, you know, in early March, 2020, we need to address what's happening in our community in response to COVID. Um, but by the time it was all said and done, we had over 50 institutional funders and over a thousand individuals from our community who were supporting our community, supporting the St. Louis region through the COVID-19 Regional Response Fund. The Black Communities Investment Initiative is one that, you know, really we owe to Nikki. Um, she answered the phone when uh, Facebook called and said, um, hey, we are selecting 20 community foundations around the country and um, will be uh, with, with a million dollar grant that we, that we want to be focused on black communities. And we added to that $500,000 from the COVID fund. We used a community advisory board that consisted of um, community members and nonprofits and other um, philanthropies and businesses and some of our board members to come up with 82, was it Nikki? 82 nonprofits, Black-led nonprofits that received funding in this um, pooled fund. And then if we think way, way back to 2019 when we were prepping for the regional census fund, this was another pooled fund that, um, that was made up of um, again, 10 different institutional funders that came together to say, we want to make sure that the St. Louis region is well represented in the 2000 census. Um, sadly, that got slightly um, sidetracked by COVID in 2020. So the other thing that we do is we are home to a number of partnerships and initiatives, and these come to us in a variety of different ways. You can read here about four, the Bridge to Landfill Community Project Fund, Digital Divide, the Regional Response Team, and the Spirit of St. Louis Women's Fund, which again, we'll talk about um, a little more a little later. Um, the two I really like to highlight here, though, are, um, are the Digital Divide and the Regional Response Team. But the Digital Divide, is a multi-phase effort to address the various aspects of the digital divide, just as it says. Um, and, and typically when we think about digital divide, we think about access to Wi-Fi and we think about access to um, the equipment, the laptop or the, or the hotspot or something. Um, but really what we are talking about here is a much deeper understanding of, um, of how lack of access to, um, to the digital world, the internet, um, and an understanding of how to use and how to work within the digital world um, impacts not just education, but health, employment, um, older adult services, that whole um, general communication, that, that whole gamut of how the digital world impacts um, people today and what it means when that divide is, um, if, if, we don't, um, if we don't address that gap and how that will um, keep inequities going in our community. <coughs> Excuse me. The regional response team grew out of our COVID response. Um, it was um, the regional response team um, was pulled together first by Jason Purnell at the request of the um, county um, of the St. Louis County to to 
see how we how the RRT could coordinate services, working with the co-ads, looking, I'm sorry, the um, community organizations, active in disasters, um, bringing in other sectors that um, can help support or could help support the, um, the, the COVID response um, and to really think about long-term recovery and how we get past just the immediate response into how do we think about leaving our community better and stronger at the other end. So in September 2020, we became the fiscal sponsor for the regional response team. Um, and they have just been terrific to work with. And um, as they think about the, you know, the inequities in our community and how COVID really sp spotlighted those, some of the efforts they've been working on are long-term flood response, um, eviction prevention, education around um, health disparities, that kind of thing. Um, so that is, um, and then the next slide shows a list of the partnerships and coalition building efforts that we're a part of. Um, and this could be, this is, you know, a limited list um, and it, it, it includes not just efforts that Nikki and Emily and I are involved with, but also others among our, um, among the team here at the St. Louis Community Foundation. We get involved in a lot of different things and we do so, so that we can help identify efforts and organizations that are impacting needs in our community. And as I said, this is, this is just a partial list. Um, it's, it's hard to keep track of all the different things that, that our 18 staff are, are involved with. So that's a little bit about who we support and how we do it. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Emily. Awesome. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's here to check out the YouTube page for the St. Louis Community Foundation because we did a training earlier this month that um, went into um, some more details about grants and some of the things that we know that we look for or some of our um, stakeholders look for in a grant application, but I'm just going to do kind of an overview of the grant programs that we support. And Elizabeth has already done some of that too, so we'll tag team that. Um, so the types of grants that we're talking about um, kind of fall into two different camps that um, right side or left side of the slide um, is just really focused on what it looks like from kind of that donor advised fund perspective where someone may come in and already know what they are um, interested in supporting. Um, and that is really kind of a just an internal process. Um, and we are, we are really excited as a team when we get invited into that conversation where someone comes and they have an area of community work they're interested in. And then because we're in communication with all of you, we get to say, hey, don't miss this group, or we know that this need is um, is being ex exacerbated right now, um, consider investing here. So um, that all kind of happens on not necessarily a predictable basis, but it's really exciting. And so that's why we um, encourage you to let us know what you're doing um, so that we can be prepared for those conversations. And then what we spend a lot of our time on is the competitive grant programs. Um, and that's where a few of those donor advised funds um, have come up with a competitive grant process, but then we also do that kind of consulting and back office work for the private and family foundations um, that Elizabeth mentioned. And so, um, oh, I'm just gonna go this side. Uh, basically the difference uh, we um, put together <laughs> this little meme. Um, really straightforward. And then this is the other side of this uh, thing you you know. It, it takes a lot of work for you to put together those um, grant applications. And we spend a lot of time reviewing and evaluating them. Um, and as do our fund holders and uh, the boards that are making these final decisions. Um, so practically what this looks like um, is there's a list of programs you can find on our website. Um, and I'll just kind of go over a couple of those now. So the Charles Foundation, just closed, so please tune in next year at this, um, just a bit earlier in the fall um, next year if you if you missed that one. And that one is uh, very place-based and with a specific population serves older adults um, in South City um, in a couple of different ways. And um, that will be open again next fall. And then the Gateway Regional Environmental Fund and the Guy B. Jaffe and Judy Schwartz Jaffe Charitable Fund are ones that will be coming up. Um, so keep those on your radar that will, those grants are awarded in second quarter. Um, 
And the Gateway Regional Environmental Fund is really laser focused on carbon reduction. Um, so if that's something that's relevant to your work, you have questions about that, please reach out to our staff. And then the, um, the Jaffe Fund is focused on job creation, entrepreneurship, and cultural arts. Um, and they are both really fun to work with. And those are both just open processes. So we, we learn a lot about work going on in the community through those. And we're always here to answer questions. Um, and then the Spirit of St. Louis Fund was on a previous slide as well. But that one's unique. It's 200 um, philanthropically minded women who um, have pooled their resources together to do a grant making process um, rather than one board or family. Um, and so it's a lengthy process, but each time um, you kind of get different folks uh, reviewing your work and um, getting interested in what you're doing. And again, our this is under our umbrella. So if we're throwing it out there to you, um, we welcome questions and kind of interaction with you based on these programs. Um, Elizabeth has touched on these private foundation grant programs. Um, again, Burgess has that um, online, LO, online LOI process and the Pettus Foundation um, is also invitation. Um, by invitation. So both of those are things if you want to um, kind of figure out what that process looks like in, in terms of your work, you can reach out to our staff. And then I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the Episcopal Presbyterian Health Trust because for the past year, they've been going through a strategic planning process. Um, they have really seen a, an increase in the number of applications they're getting. And so the trustees just really wanted to say, how can we use um, kind of a, a smaller fund um, to, to impact health because health needs are vast. And so how can we be really strategic? And so um, kind of as Elizabeth alluded to, they have really focused, um, centered themselves on access to care. Um, and so we'll see a final kind of set of priorities um, approved um, or modified by quarter four for this year. And um, the information on what those priorities will look like and what the process, um, any process changes will be um, posted to our website, NEPHT's website. And just because we know that any change can be kind of disruptive and you might have questions, we're going to do some virtual sessions for nonprofits around this program. So there's three dates listed here. All of those, um, the content will be the same. So you don't need to come to all three. Um, and we'll be posting those um, information on those will come out. Um, so you don't have to you don't have to rely on this, but um, this would be a good moment to say if you're not signed up for our newsletter, um, please sign up for our newsletter because our communications team, um, Emily Bauman, who introduced us, uh, they're incredible and they will make sure that that information gets into your hands. Um, and that's the one of the ways we support nonprofits outside of financial supports too. That's that third bullet point on here is um, our communications team makes sure we um, publish the information relevant to our programs, but also does a good job sleuthing around the community for other um, capacity or grant opportunities that might be relevant to your work. Because um, while we have a lot of things under our umbrella, there's a lot of um, really important work that isn't as represented in our priorities. Um, we want to make sure that you know about the groups that are investing in your work. Um, so other key ways to kind of engage with us outside of these grant programs is give us TL Day. Um, if you meet with us, we will tell you about Give STL Day because it's a really exciting um, way to get your, your mission and name out to the community, um, kind of unlike working with our donors who, you know, have enough um, of resources to set up a donor advice fund. You can have new donors at Give STL Day that are donating $10 and they might, you know, want to be with you for years and years and years because they're so excited. So Give STL Day is a really exciting way for nonprofits and donors to connect kind of in a different unique way outside of the rest of what we do um, and this year is going to be the 10th year um, so there'll be extra buzz and um, just like last year if you were part of it there will be trainings released on how to really take advantage of that day um, and so you can find last year's trainings online at the Give STL Day website um, and then as soon as registration opens we'd encourage you to register early so that you can take advantage of new trainings this year. Um, Fiscal sponsorships are another way we support nonprofits. Um, we are pretty strategic in who um, we, we utilize that um, support for, um, usually doing some community-wide work. Um, and a lot of our fiscal sponsors have kind of flown off and become their own um, initiative. It's really exciting. I'm very proud of their work. Um, so Gateway Early Childhood Alliance would be one example of a fiscal sponsor organization um, that just had a really exciting um, win with ARPA funds. So yeah, we're we're really proud of, of those relationships. And if you have more questions, again, that can come to our team and we can help you navigate that process. Um, 
Nonprofit endowments has already been spoken to. Um, one thing I would highlight with that is some groups that are um, a local chapter of a national organization have been interested in that so that um, if, if some structure ever changes within that organization, that resources are still being committed to purpose-driven work in this community. Um, and then also our team has been doing trainings like this outside of the Give STL Day Circle, just so that some of your questions about how to work with um, community foundations or um, other, other topics relevant to you can be addressed. Um, we're open to what you might like to see next. Um, so I probably sound like a broken record through some of this, but we really encourage you to reach out to us um, and ask questions and check in. Um, that can be around a specific grant program that makes it a pretty easy conversation. So we kind of know what you're interested in, but we also you know, have introductory conversations with groups frequently just to find out about their work. Um, there's a lot of new nonprofits. There's a lot of nonprofits who have been working for a long time, but we just haven't gotten to connect with them um, in the past. So this is your invitation to make sure that we know what you're doing. Um, and if we can be a resource to you in any way, we, we hope we, we, we look forward to that. Um, and then whenever we have those conversations or outside of that, we welcome your marketing materials. Don't create anything for us, but um, we just whatever you would typically send um, out, just one pager, something like that so that we have it on hand um, helps us have internal conversations and um, just means we're ready with um, we're ready with kind of a bite-sized uh, snapshot of what you're doing um, whenever that comes up so that we can advocate for um, your work. And again, sign up for our newsletter and participate in Give STL Day. <laughs> Please, we love, we love to see um, folks getting resources and um, some buzz on that day. And then I'm going to say we welcome your questions. I, can, I can't actually see the chat, but I see that folks have uh, posted in the chat. And then um, this is uh, kind of the, the one email we'll throw out there um, and that's going to our full team and someone will get back to you about specific questions with anything we've gone over, but. Um, so um, there is a comment or a question in the chat um, asking us to comment on the newsletter and social media support. Um, Emily Bauman, are you, do you wanna take that or would you like one of us to? Yes, I can take that. I'm trying to figure out how to re-spotlight myself. Here I am. Hello. Um, Barbara, would you mind elaborating on your question? I'm not completely sure what you're asking. And you're welcome to come off mute or make an addition in the chat. Yeah, my question was uh, just if you could comment on what sort of support you provide through newsletter and social media. Is it um, the foundation newsletter and social media or assisting nonprofits in their own publications? Um, so we're primarily talking about our newsletters and social medias. Um, if you have questions for your organization's social media presence, I would definitely recommend that you keep an eye out for the Give Us TL Day training schedule because we talk about content, uh, social media strategy, visuals, that kind of stuff a lot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I do want to emphasize for that newsletter um, that our communications put, team puts together, they work really hard not, uh, not only to have information about our grant um, that are open, but other grants in the community as well. I know Emily touched on that, but it's yes. something I really want to emphasize because it is such a huge, huge piece. And um, I just commend them for, for pushing that information out there, but it is a wealth of information. And I, I always tell people to get that. Mm -hmm. Yes, our, our nonprofit newsletter is the Foundation Flyer, and that always includes a section about grant-making opportunities through the St. Louis Community Foundation, but also other opportunities that we've learned about in community. And then if the Community Foundation has a specific grant-making opportunity, for example, through one of the programs that our wonderful community investment team supports, we will often send a one-off newsletter just specifically about that to make sure that the information is being distributed. The other thing, though, is to um, sign up for our Facebook and Instagram, um, because Emily and um, Emily does just a terrific job of posting those grant programs um, that, that we come across on social media and tries to do that, you know, pretty, you know, as soon as something comes comes up because since the foundation flyer is what once a quarter um it's bi-monthly bi-monthly you know sometimes things come up you know 
the week after and have a three weeks until the deadline. And so, so our social media, if you track our social media, you'll, you'll get to hear about those and other opportunities, sometimes trainings that are coming up for nonprofits that other organizations are doing, whether that's NSC or um, you know, one of our other funders that we, that we collaborate with. It's just great way to, to um, stay on top of what's happening in, in community. And again, I want to commend um, the communications team and Emily for keeping that up to date. Other questions? We ran through a lot of material really quickly. So you can put them in the chat or you can come off mute. Can you guys hear me? Um, now we can, yeah. Hi. Hey, Shalana. Um, yeah, hey. I just inboxed. Hi, Emily. Um, I was wondering what is the status has to be um, to participate in the um, giving Give SBL Day as a nonprofit? I'm in the early stages. I uh, filed um, state, state level. So I wanted to know, like, what is the, uh, what yes. is the requirement that you have? I am going to drop a link in the chat to the FAQ page of the Give STL Day website because there's a lot of great information in there, but obviously the nonprofit section is the longest. Um, so eligible organizations, you do have to be a 501c3 public charity with a mailing address or footprint services programs in the greater St. Louis metro region. And so the counties that we serve are the ones that fall under the greater St. Louis metro region, and those are listed out on the FAQ page. But if you aren't sure if you um, are able to register, definitely reach out to, to me, to the info at stlgives.org email, and we'll help you figure out if you are eligible to participate and give STL Day, because we want everybody who can to be able to. But Emily, there are no budget restrictions. There. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I missed that part of the question. There's no budget restriction. There's no fee to participate. We welcome organizations of any size. And any interest area. Yes. Thank you, guys. Anything else? We've got a question in the chat about knowing if an organization qualifies for funding sources. <laughs> As an overwhelmed nonprofiter, and yes, you guys have a lot of information thrown at you. What's your next step? Um, so I think as Emily and Nikki have said, um, feel free to reach out and, um, you know, through the um, grants at stlgives.org and tell us a little bit about your organization. And um, we'll see if it makes sense to have a phone call or a Zoom call or a um, or a face-to-face -face meeting to get to know you and your organization a little bit better. Um, you can also spend some time on our website, Give STL. Um, no, stlgives.org um, or the Burgess Foundation or the EPHT websites. Um, they, um, to learn a little more about those two grant making um, processes, our website has the others that come um, from our funds that, that Emily mentioned, and Pettis Foundation does not have its own website. So just to learn a little bit more about those, and then um, if one of those that's invitation only is of interest to you, then you, we would definitely want you to reach out to um, either Emily or Nikki or, or myself to see you know what the whether it's a good fit or, or not um, I'll, I'll jump in and say the other thing that can be helpful about conversations with us is we're very honest that we aren't always the right fit but right. um we are we are i always like to say two and a half social workers um since Emily, <laughs> emily's master's is in urban planning but um, we, we really love nonprofit and, and our goal is to see, you know, impact and, and change in the St. Louis community as a whole. 
Um, so if we aren't the right people, we will do our best to, to, to throw out resources and, and, and give you, you know, some other possible places to, to look. Um, I think that that's one of the values of a call with us. We, we won't just say, you know, no, none of these fit for you. Good luck. You know, we will try to, to point you in the right direction in the community. Um, and also I would just throw out there too, um, you know, if you are, you know, a group that you came in with this particular mission, so your programs fall under that for your folks, but you know that whoever you're supporting or um, could use other, has other needs or could use other services, we're talking to so many groups, so we might be able to suggest folks that um, could be a relevant kind of referral source or partner, and if there's just ways that we can ever facilitate an intro, we love to, we don't know everyone, um, but um any kind of resource we can offer outside of the funding as well we are happy to we have nine minutes left we can answer additional questions or we can give you a little bit of your day back the one thing i will i will um point out on one more thing is with the newsletter, the other thing that is important is sometimes um, we didn't really emphasize this, but sometimes some of those grant processes, we have those that are static that we work with, you know, annually, year after year, or whatever that grant process might look like. But with things like the Black Communities Investment Initiative, the Welcome Fund, um, those are really responses to something happening or either around us or funding becoming available to us in some way. And those are those are things that that tend to pop up and we work so hard to get the message out. Um, but that's where that um, that newsletter comes into play as well. If something new was to come on our radar, that would be in that newsletter. And, and it's like I said, it's just a wealth of knowledge. I know Nikki and Elizabeth always think this is so funny of me, but I used to work for a very tiny nonprofit in the Twin Cities and I was terrified of my community foundation. I felt like I needed to have all the answers before I ever talked to a program staff person. And so we do this in part to hopefully give you good information, but also to say, hey, we're here. We appreciate that you you do have a lot going on. So we want to make sure you know that we are a resource to your team. Um, and once I got over my fear, they were very helpful humans over there. So. I hope that we can be the same, but we just don't want that um, that barrier to be in the way for you um, reaching out. And um, yes, I, one of the reasons we do these is so that we don't seem so scary when you call. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, Michael Rubin put in the chat, do we ever marshal the funds or the funders that um, we administer into proactive initiative for the community, like the COVID response? Um, you know, Michael, that is something that we pay a lot of attention to. And when we see that community need, we do try to bring it forward. We'll do an educational session um, for our donors if it makes sense. So for instance, with the Welcome Fund, um, you know, with that wave of Afghan refugees and humanitarian parolees that were coming in, um, as well as at the same time, a wave from south of the border, um, particularly Haiti at the time. Um, you know, how do we as a community support um, folks? We, you know, we will try to make sure that our donors are aware of what the issues are and how we as the community foundation are addressing them. Um, it's an evolving process for us. And I think um, you're going to see as in the next couple of years, we roll out our new strategic plan. Um, you might see that that is going to shift and change going forward a little bit. Um, have we been, oh shucks, have we been approached by one of the billionaires who are actively giving away a significant amount of their wealth? I wish, um, but Nikki can talk about talking to Facebook, now Meta. <laughs> but... No, not, no, not any billionaires yet, um, but yes, we, I think that the COVID fund really did put us on the map um, for, for being responsible stewards of, of 
large amounts of funds and being able to mobilize community voice very quickly to get those funds out. And that's something I do want to emphasize for COVID and, and the Black Communities Investment Initiative. You know, in those cases where we're not, we are not spending the funds of our donors or we have a board behind us or a family, we are, you know, we are incorporating community voice. We are going to other people to bring them to the table to make sure that we understand what the needs are and, and we have help in making those decisions because we don't want to make them in the silo. So no, I don't, I don't think we've attracted the billionaires yet, but I think we've We've really created infrastructure around our grant making that that shows certainly shows people with, of wealth that we are are responsible and um, and can be impactful with it if if, uh, if given that opportunity. But Joy, if um, after the billionaires give to your organization, you want to send them our way, we're happy to work with them. Well, if there are no further questions, or if anybody wants to send a question later to the community investment team by emailing grants at stlgives.org, <laughs> uh, we're always here for you. I'm also always here for you from a communication standpoint, but I think we can give you back a few minutes of your morning. Go ahead and stop the recording and look forward to seeing all of you again in the future. And thank you to the community investment team for another great presentation. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That's such a nice comment at the end. Thank you. Appreciate I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.